Hello everybody and welcome to 27. Today I have something extra special for you. When I was 23, I bought my very first classic car. Not only was it a classic car, it was an Alfa Romeo. Not only was it an Alfa Romeo, but it was a real Alfa Romeo from the days before Fiat took over. It was a 1750 GTV. 20 years later, I have this very car here with me today and I'm going to be driving it. When I was a young kid in Italy, I used to go on holiday. This was in the, I was born in 73, so the sort of mid to late 70s, we used to go on holiday. We used to drive from Milan down the Italian coast uh, to go to uh, Vulcano or Ponza or Sicily on holiday. When we used to drive down, occasionally you'd see these quite aggressive sort of coupes sort of barreling past. They always had quite questionable characters in them. And these were the Alpha GTVs of that time. They were towards the end of the build series then. So they were sort of um, in that range where the cars aren't quite as sought after and less savoury characters start to sort of get hold of them. So I always remember them from those days. They had a, they had a sort of a mysterious, dangerous streak to them. Always stayed in my mind. When I was in my sort of early 20s, I decided that what I really wanted was, a, I've always been into cars, but what I really wanted was a, a classic car, something that I could put my hands on and something that had history, that had character and that brought me back to those early days in Italy. So I soon decided it had to be an Alfa Romeo. My first choice was actually the Duetto. At the time, the classic car market was quite different and duettos were actually quite expensive. You were looking at about 15 to 20,000 for a good one. So it was a little bit out of my price range, but the coupes, the GTVs, the 105 series cars, they were going for sort of five to 10,000 for a very good car. So they were well within reach. And I started looking at the classifieds. The 1750 GTV is actually the most desirable of the 105 series cars, apart perhaps from the GTA, but that was extremely limited run. The 1750 engine is the most drivable, it's revvy, it has enough torque, it has the whole package. The two litre was a nice engine as well, but it's much rougher up top. The smaller engines are a little bit more gutless. This particular car was known as a CKD. That stands for complete knockdown. The reason for that was that it was shipped as a series of parts to South Africa to avoid crippling import duties, it was then assembled over there. So there's a plaque there which proves that. It says made in South Africa. Apparently the bodies were all in white as well and these were painted in whatever colour the importers in South Africa chose once they got there. So it's particularly interesting. This is also a Mark II 1750. There's only a small difference. The Mark I is probably slightly more desirable. It doesn't have those little overriders and the indicators are slightly different as well. All in all, if you're gonna be buying a 105 series GTV, the 1750 is the one that you should be looking for. It's really the holy grail. It's the perfect one of these cars. After a while, I found a car which was actually based in Wales. It was a South African import. And as with most classic cars, your, the biggest enemy by far is rust. 
that's what I was most worried about. It wasn't the mechanical stuff, it was making sure that there wasn't a car that was riddled with rust. So I started looking and I found this 105 series in Wales. We went down to have a look at it. It was a car imported from South Africa. It had been in the country about five years and the guy who owned it, was a lovely old fellow who had a, a, a BMB in a really picturesque part of Wales. We saw the car, I brought a friend with me, Richard, who's uh, known as Hooter, who's really good with these old cars, just to make sure that we knew what we were getting into. I knew what I was buying and there weren't any surprises. And it was a good, genuine, solid car. It wasn't perfect, but it was good. We drove it back down to London, and I remember on the way down, actually, the brakes were binding because the car hadn't been used that much. And so it was a bit of an adventure, but we made it back. I was incredibly excited. I had my own car. I had all these projects, these things I wanted to do to it. You know, I wanted to start working on it straight away, improve it. It had really big, tall springs at the front, I think, for the South African roads to stop it hitting on, you know, the stones and everything else, give it more ground clearance. So it looked a little bit ridiculous. And the engine ran okay, but it was a little bit rough, so I wanted to start, you know, tuning the carbs, doing all that kind of stuff. And this is actually where some of the disappointments for me first began with the Alpha. At that stage in life, I didn't have very many tools. And every time I tried to do something to this car, I couldn't do it because I didn't have the right kind of spanner with the ki right kind of reach or anything like that, or the interior, which I wanted to pretty up. It just all became a bit more complicated. So that was a little bit of a disappointment. I, I, I ended up taking it to some alpha specialists and actually spending a huge amount of money on it. I still remember those bills to this day. And they improved it significantly. They changed all the suspension bushing, the springs and everything else and brought it back to the way it should have been. And it was much, much better to drive. However, in those days, I was still like a, an immature young pup and, you know, I wanted to just scream the engines. I wanted to get cars sideways. And the GTV just didn't respond that well to that. It wasn't the right kind of car. Yeah, you could get the back end out, but it didn't like it. The rear axle would wobble. It, it's not the kind of car that was built to be driven like that. It's the kind of car that I've realized since, because I've had other Alphas, you have to work with it. You have to be smooth. You have to get into a flow with it, and then it's going to give back to you. So today, I'm going to take it for a drive and I'm going to see if I can banish those old demons. Well, it's almost exactly 20 years ago that I sold this Alfa Romeo and that Tony bought it. Now, it's quite a funny story because in actual fact, I never met Tony when he bought this car. I sold it through an intermediary and we never met. Three or four years ago, I got a call at work which has nothing to do with cars and somebody called Tony left a message about my Alpha. Now, at the time, I had completely forgotten that was 16 years before. I had no idea about any Alpha, it was work. That's really bizarre. I was quite suspicious about this guy ringing out the blue at my work. And I rang him up and it turned out that he was the chap who had bought my car. Tony had read an article that I'd written for Petrolicious. He'd seen my name, Jack Pegararo, and he thought, well, there can't be many Jack Pegararos about. This has to be the same guy who I bought the car from. Tony's been super grateful to me because I did my usual thing. I basically got this car, I spent a load of money on it, got bored of it, sold it, and he bought it. Now, it's said that Italians are deep of pocket and short of arm and Tony is quite pleased because he thinks he's been able to do that thanks to me he hasn't had to spend a penny on this car really I spent so much on it and did all the main things that Dita doing that he's just been able to keep it ticking over now he's gonna completely restore it soon but it's a good example of a 1750 I mentioned that I wasn't completely enamored with the Alpha when I had it all those years ago. And today it's been incredibly emotional to be able to get behind the wheel again. 
but the handling still leaves me slightly bemused. That little engine is just a gem. It's responsive, it's revvy. It tries hard. It spins up really well, it's lovely. 4,000 RPM, put your foot down, revs up, you get a little extra at four and a half. That's kind of the sweet spot, is three and a half to five. The chassis moves about all over the place though. It's, it's not uncomfortable, the suspension's quite comfortable. It rolls a fair amount, but it's always moving all over the road. I almost find as if the chassis and the engine are mismatched. The engine is so eager and so happy to spin up that they encourage you to thrash the car, but it totally doesn't like to be driven like that on the bends. It likes to be driven with a bit more care and attention. It's not a car you would decide as sharp or precise. It simply isn't. You navigate it more than sliding through a corner. You sort of chuck it in and point it through. Also, it feels very much like a car that, where the back end, geez, it's right in the middle of the road, where the back end is completely pinned down and all the inputs happen at the front. I know that's, okay, that, that sounds quite obvious, but it isn't. It doesn't feel neutral. It feels very much like the back's pinned down and you're doing everything with the front of the car. I mean, you can brake traction in the back. I've done it myself, but it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel like that kind of that kind of car. When I had it, it had a different gear knob. And one thing that Tony's done that I not necessarily a complete fan of is that he's changed it to to something else. Now, the problem I have with this is it's actually quite similar to the one I have in the Evora. It's a big aluminium knob. It's just a bit too large for the palm, I think, and it detracts from the delicacy, the thin rim and so on. It doesn't quite go for me in this one. It doesn't quite work. The thing that dates it most is actually the chassis. That's what makes it feel like an old car. The engine is great. The brakes are surprisingly good. When you tip it into a corner, the steering really loads up, but it's slow. It's not, <laughs> it's definitely far from a fast rack. Gear changes, fantastic. When I had it, it used to crunch a little bit going from third to second if you didn't double declutch. Tony's had this completely refurbished and it's very sweet. It's quite long. But it's a sweet gear change, it's nice. Just a smaller knob, I think, would, uh, would be better. But the pedals are incredibly offset off to the right and come way further forward than you would think was needed or possible. There's that traditional thing about the Italian driving position, which is tiny little legs and massive sort of upper body, long arm stretch, and this car completely bears it out huge stretch to the wheels and the pedals are right well closer than you want it's a fun car to drive i do really like it but i'm, I'm slightly i'm slightly disappointed that i don't love it more i don't know why when i had my since this car i had a, an alfa romeo julia 1963 and i just love the way that drove it was like a little jewel it was precise, it was tiny, it was dinky, it was, it was fabulous. This doesn't quite capture that for me. It doesn't quite get there. It's better than any modern car, mind you, um, because, oh, you know, you can still get, get a lot back from driving it. But it's not the best amongst the classics that I've experienced. I love this interior though, it's so sort of 60s and so so Italian, fantastic. And the way the 105 series cars look, just amazing. There's a timeless quality about them there and they're not too showy, they're not too in your face.
I hope you've enjoyed the video. I've certainly enjoyed driving my old car today. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, please like the video, and I'll see you for the next one. The first choices actually were the, the, the barquette, not the barquetta, the um... Uber. That's because of the tall low... Hi Pete. <laughs> oh God, what's it called? The... Yes. As well, it's not a fast system by any measure or any amount. Uh, he hasn't spent, he hasn't managed, he hasn't had.